Namaste. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Videshi Desi podcast. Uh, it's so wonderful to see you, even though we are so far away. And uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to get to know your uh, story in a more detailed manner. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to, before um, anything else, I'd like to go to the very beginningless beginning of your journey. And that takes me back to the moment that you shared with me that the person who had introduced you to the Taoist arts, let's say to the Eastern philosophies was your father. And so I would love for you to share with us uh, about your father and about that journey. Yeah, absolutely. So that really was you know, the beginning for me in that um, I grew up, I feel like where I grew up and kind of the context I grew up within really set the space for my profound love of Indian culture and Indian arts. And part of that reason is that where I grew up is so how do I say it's very middle class it's very white it's very just like there wasn't a lot of culture at all where I grew up and even the landscape was kind of more like dry but it wasn't quite desert it was just kind of like it was a very gray homogenous <laughs> I mean it was beautiful where, it, where it was that? it's at Boise Idaho oh, so okay. in the USA and it's fine you know it was fine but, but for as, as early as i can remember i felt like the ugly duckling like i came through in this place and i just never felt like i belonged there even as a child even though that was all i ever knew which is part of the reason i really resonate with indian philosophy i'm like past lives make so much sense to me because why else would i come into this place and just be like, where the heck am I? Like, I don't belong here. What is this place? But that was how it was. And thank the goddess for my father, because he was my window that something else existed. And my father um, got into, he, he was born and raised in Wisconsin and um, grew up, you know, in the 60s. And both of his brothers went off to the Vietnam War and he tried to get out of Dodge and part of that he went up to Canada and like followed Led Zeppelin and like he was part of that whole movement. <laughs> movement in the 50s. Yeah, exactly. Um, so being part of that, he got really interested in martial arts and the martial arts eventually led him to his Taiwanese master um, who he had recently moved from Taiwan to um, Vancouver Island in BC. So he heard about this master and uh, ended up going to study with his teacher, Henry Wong. And that was the beginning of his journey into the Taoist arts. And similar to myself, he really, he found himself through those arts. You know, there was something really there for him. And um, so for as long as I can remember, He's been a really avid practitioner. And in the West, we don't have a lot of um, examples of that level of discipline. It's kind of given in the East, in Eastern traditions, in, in especially spiritual traditions. But even if you go to China and you go to the parks, you'll see so many people, just you know, everyday people doing Tai Chi and Qigong in the parks. So it's just part of the culture. And uh, so from a very young age, I was seeing my father every single morning. He'd get up and he'd do this strange dance. <laughs> and he'd take me to the park and I'd be embarrassed because, you know, all the kids are staring at him because he's doing his Tai Chi, you know. But he'd take any moment he had in the day to do his practice. Like he's, I mean, my level of discipline still doesn't match his. <laughs> So he's been this kind of guiding and inspiring light on my path in that way and um, has really shown me the results. I mean, he's been a practitioner since before I was born. He's uh, 
pretty high level at this point and mm. in his arts, but he doesn't make a big show of it. You know, it's just like, especially in his um, elder years, he's, it's really just him and he takes on private students now and he doesn't even charge them. <laughs> it's just like, if someone's serious about it, he'll share the teachings. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so for the longest time, he was just this weird, you know, my father was strange. Uh, my mother was very m much more conventional and they separated from an early age. So I kind of grew up in two split realities and it was like different timelines. And, and for the longest time, I resonated more with the conventional. And at some point, I, it was when I was 14, I started getting really into health and da 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 and I decided to try it out. And so I started studying Qigong with my father at 14 and it was the first time I felt energy. And I was a very mystical child, you know, it was like, I was very connected to nature. I loved nature, I loved animals. I could feel, you know, I remember having inquiries about God and the divine at a very young age, but I didn't have any context for it. And when I first started doing Qigong and I started feeling energy and feeling myself connected to something greater I re it was like the the veils of the unseen realms just kind of opened for me and everything I kind of intuited began to fall into place and so I consider Taoism my mother system it was kind of the mm. roots of my spiritual path um, and while I still carry some of that lineage it it's what ultimately led me to Tantra, to classical Tantra and to India and to dance and everything, you know, like that was that was the beginning for me. It unlocked this whole other reality. And, and in some ways, I feel like I, I was kind of a continuation for my father's path. Wow. But then through that, I found my own, which was in a different tradition. So that was kind of how it all started uh, with that. And so he's been my great inspiration for what discipline mm. and dedication looks like and the results of that. And how does he feel about you today? Is he proud of all the work you're doing? <laughs> so proud. <Aww. laughs> yeah, he loves it. He's very supportive. Uh, he's probably my number one fan. <laughs> oh, that is so wonderful. That's yeah. so wonderful. Yeah. Um, so let us move a bit now to India. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to understand when did you get into the Indian esoteric arts and how, how, how did that unfold for you? Unfold for you? Yeah, so I really feel like my journey was one of embodiment and there was a long time, so right around the same time that I was starting to practice the Taoist arts, I was also, you know, I was a teenager. I started at 14 and mm -hmm. I had pretty serious eating disorders um, at the same time. So it was like this interesting place where I was like so disconnected from my body, but the divine was guiding me towards the cure at the same time. And um, so the, the, the Tai Chi and Qigong really brought me into my body and led me eventually to dance, which at first was more like ecstatic free dance that helped kind of just shake off all these chains and all this societal conditioning, uh, especially I think as women, we all have this conditioning around our bodies. We may have a good relationship with them. We may not probably at different points in our life, we haven't had good relationship to our bodies. And I found the divine through my body, through dance. And it was before I even knew that there were sacred dance traditions in the world. You know, it was just a very direct experience where um, I didn't have like the context for it at the time because I was what, 17, 18, 19, you know, mm -hmm. and still living in Idaho. Um, but something really came through and it was like my first really strong direct connections of the divine and what i now understand as shakti you know kind of connecting to this great power and energy that was in me um and that changed my life it, it healed my eating disorders without me having to like go on medications and do therapy and all of that. It was just, it was like it cracked something in me. 
So that led me on a whole journey with dance. You know, many things happened um, within that. And I admittedly entered into Tantra. So I got into through the Taoist system, Taoist sexual energy cultivation practices at a very young age. Um, I always had a lot of <laughs> sexual energy as a young woman, uh, particularly, and I wasn't so great at channeling it. And so mm-hmm. I found those exercises and then eventually I heard about Tantra, but you know, that kind of Tantra, <laughs> the more Neo-Tantra, and then I was so fascinated and I'd already gotten into yoga at this time. So I was just, I was like a ravenous spiritual <laughs> being at a young age. I was just like, what is this? What is this? And trying all the different things. and. Mm-hmm. Throughout that, dance was kind of the core of it. I was very curious. I was very enamored with Tantra um, via what I thought it was back then, (laughs) Uh, which I think, you know, nowadays this is a tangent, but uh, in the Tantra communities, there can be a lot of like shame around like the Neo Tantra thing and like, that's not what it is. And I am one of those proponents. It's like, hey, that's not exactly what Tantra is. But I'm also an example of someone who, because of that, I was like, ooh, it was like the king, the carrot was dangled in front of me and I ran after the carrot and it led me to the most profound path of transformation. And so I don't think we, you know, it was like that was my gateway. And um, I think that was really important. So along with that, there was, you know, I was studying dance. I moved to the Bay Area of California to um, like the San Francisco Bay Area to study belly dance because, you know, I've been in this like wild dance journey and something in me wanted to like cultivate and start harnessing that energy, you know, and I think there's a place for just the ecstatic unbridled formless movement of energy but then there's also a place where we start to create a container and a structure and it helps actually harness that energy more um and i think that my roots in qigong and tai chi where it was like you know all the movements are so slow and you stay even with the movement connected to the energy within the body so that kind of gave me a context for what container a container can do for energy mm-hmm. so I, it, this wasn't conscious but i think that that's on a soul level what i was looking for mm-hmm. and um the sacred aspect of dance was always there so it was like i went into the belly dance community particularly the tribal belly dance community and that piece was missing it was mostly focused just on the structure and the aesthetics of the dance and that sacred kind of communion with the divine through the dance wasn't quite there And I remembered shortly after I moved to the Bay, um, I was living in a friend of mine's attic. I hardly had any money left. And I saw a poster for a temple dance workshop. And I was just like, what is that? I don't know what that is. And I spent like my last, I don't know, $30 on going to this workshop. And it was like very baby beginner ODC dance, uh, Mm -hmm. classical Indian dance, but it, it just, something was there for me. And I was like, this is it. And like, my soul knows this on some level. I understand this. This makes sense to me on a very deep level. And it was within six months of that, that I was on a, a plane to India. And it just, I didn't, all I needed was a little taste. And I was just like, I'm going. <laughs> so that was kind of what brought me to that. And then it just, all those rivers flowed together. So I'd already, you know, been doing yoga since I started yoga when I was maybe 18. And then, you know, I was into all the Taoist arts alongside of that. And then the, um, I was so intrigued by Tantra and what I thought it was. And I was already starting to have like the deities from that system come into my life, particularly Shiva and Durga before I even went to India, were starting to make interesting appearances. Mm. Um, I went into, for example, and this is just how it works. It's like this mysterious unfolding that doesn't actually make linear sense. But at some point we look back and we're like, oh, wow. (laughs) But I remember finally moving into a home in East Oakland and um, I was in Berkeley 
I don't even know what I was doing. I was running some errand and I'd taken the bus or walked or something. And I walked by this little shop, a statue shop. And I just, something in me was like, I have to go in there. And there were all these different carvings. And there was one of Shiva, and I didn't even know it was Shiva then, but I just fell in love with this carving of Shiva. And it was like kind of like pewter or cement or something like really heavy. And I end up <laughs> buying, you know, again, I don't even have that much money back then. I end up buying this and putting him in my backpack. And I've got this like brick, like the Shiva brick in my <laughs> backpack that I then had to like haul across the bay, like walk to bar, take bar, you know, like with yeah, this yeah, yeah. really, I don't even know how many pounds. Um, so he came into my life and he was a big uh, part of my journey, my first my first trip to India. And um, oh. yeah, so that was kind of how I ended up going to India. And then it just, the whole thing started opening up. And yeah, that was kind of how it happened. <laughs> so how did you prepare to go to India? And uh, where did you go when you first went? How was that preparation? Yeah, so I was terrified. It was, um, I hadn't done too much travel up to that point. Like I'd been to Mexico, I went to Guatemala, I went to Costa Rica. So I had a little bit of experience of traveling in other countries um, at that point. But India, I just had this, I think part of my fear or even terror I remember landing on the airplane and I was just like praying to the goddess I was like ma please take care of me <laughs> like I'm trusting you <laughs> um but I just knew there was something in my heart that was like this is not just me going on a trip this is like my life is going to completely change and you know when we step into the unknown we don't know what's on the other side of that so there was just this sense of like everything i've known everything like everything is about to change but i didn't quite understand what that looked like yet and so i had a lot of anticipation uh leading up to the trip one of the ways I prepared is I just, you know, I had a lot of friends who were travelers and mm. many who'd been to India and I would just talk their ears off about it and ask them all kinds of questions and uh, get hints from them. And that was about it. I mean, I really, I didn't have a lot of context. I was just kind of like, well, here we go. But But the dance was what, beyond the Tantra and yoga, the dance was really the catalyst because that was kind of my main, main thing at the time. Um, but I'd never, <laughs> I'd never studied dance besides like taking random belly dance classes and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So someone told me about um, Kalina Shakti and Shakti School of Dance. And so I looked it up and I was just like, okay, I'm going. <laughs> mm -hmm. This was in 2010. Uh, so that was really helpful. It was really helpful for me to just have a place that I was going to immediately um, and to have that purpose rather than just, you know, I think there's two ways traveling, to traveling. Yeah. Yeah. There's like two ways to go to India. You just show up and are like, okay, here we go. Or you're like, I'm going for a particular thing. And for me, it was really helpful to be going for a particular thing. Mm. So Yeah, I landed in Delhi at like one in the morning and I remember being afraid to leave the airport and we had, you know, it's like, I feel like Westerners can be so dramatic and I had this <laughs> image that I was literally going to walk out of the doors at the Delhi airport and just get swarmed by like people like begging and pulling on my clothes and like it was going to be this whole like crazy thing and It was not like that at all. It's never been like that. <laughs> But um, yeah, I was afraid to leave the airport. So I remember there was like a little coffee shop and I just like got a tea and like sat there for a while, and gathered my courage to like walk out the, the front door. door. <laughs> yeah. And, and how was that journey? That first uh How was the journey being in India? I guess, you know, you spend a lot of time in the school practicing dance. Um, so how was yeah. the whole experience, you know, the yes. first year? 
So my first time I went for four months, just intuitively when I bought my plane ticket, I was just like, I think I need to go for like four months. <laughs> so I, I made a ticket for four months and um, <laughs> that was my most like low budget India trip. <laughs> <laughs> so I really got the the good solid raw experience of India. Um, mm -hmm. I I finally got the courage to leave the airport and you know found I got one of the prepaid cabs because I'd been you know that was one of the advice pieces I got was just go get a prepaid. Um, somebody had given me a name for a guest house and I'm not even sure I ended up at the right one because I can't imagine that anyone would have recommended this place, but <laughs> I show up, you know, it's like two in the morning or something. And this was kind of before I knew better. I used to just kind of throw myself out there with faith and luckily, I think we all did. <laughs> we all did at the beginning and everything yeah. was fine. But here I am, it's like two in the morning and, you know, at the guest house, they were all asleep. And uh, so we're like banging on the door and then waking up the, the boys that worked there. And they're, you know, they like got up and let me in and led me to a room. And it was like to date the like worst, most dirty, like, oh, I've so ever stayed in <laughs> But the funny part is that like, Again, like the Western dramatization of things, like that was actually what I expected. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that that's just how it was going to be, but it was like this total hole. And, um, but yeah, I was just like, okay, well, this is how it is. And <laughs> so I stayed there for the first night and had no idea how I was going to get to Pushkar. I didn't used to, that's where I was going for the school was Pushkar, Rajasthan. So I didn't, back then I didn't plan ahead when I traveled. It was just like, okay, well, I know I need to get here. And then once I'm there, I'll figure out how to get to the next place. <laughs> so uh, I remember going to the train station and I totally got swirled by, you know, it was like all the trains were booked because in India, you really do have to book ahead of time. You don't, yeah. it's not that easy to show up at a train station and be like, I want to go here. So yeah. that didn't work out. And then, of course, as happens in India, she just kind of grabbed me. And this person was like, oh, you need to go there. Come with me and took me to their friend's like cab place. And it was kind of expensive, but I ended up just taking a cab and it was so mystical. I ended up. I mean, first off, I think what really stood out to me was I felt elated. You know, it was like total, you know, different world from anything I'd ever experienced. But somehow I felt so at home there right away. And it felt like this kind of homecoming um, that I, you know, I can't really explain. It's something in my soul. I think so many of us who do walk this path um, have, have that. I have experienced it. Yeah. Unexplainable, like this is a total like foreign reality, but I know this and mm. it just felt like this joyous reunion um you know plus like the jet lag made it like a little extra psychedelic and <laughs> <laughs> i was just like okay here we go and um yeah so i ended up taking a cab and i remember going getting into jaipur and seeing the forts and the pink city and it was during the kite festival oh, and so there were like hundreds of like different colored kites in the air and it was just I remember seeing an elephant walk through the street who was all painted with like neon designs and camels and it just my heart was just exploding the whole time and um and I immediately fell in love with the people um, I found them so welcoming and so easy, you know, I think sometimes there can be a big barrier between cultures, you know, when you get to a new place, it's like, how do we interact? How do we fit here? And I just found from the very beginning, I could very easily relate to everybody there. And it, uh, I mean, not everybody, but you know what I mean. It was just I uh, totally understand what you mean. I was yeah. like, so it was so welcoming and people wanted to talk and interact like it didn't feel like this lonely like here I am this lone traveler it was just people were so a lot of engaging mm. 
Yeah, and so that was really my first experience was like everyone helped me get where I needed to go and uh, of course were curious about me and I was also curious about them and it was just this like really sweet kind of curiosity. So I had a really wonderful uh, mm. into India. And uh, did you travel to more places in that did, first year? Yeah. Yeah, so I went to Pushkar, I studied ODC at Shakti School of Dance, and that was a whole other just, again, I think I broke down crying my first day in class because I was just like, this is what, like, it just made sense to me. But mm -hmm. it was hard, as you know, uh, it was my first time training in any kind of dance form, like really training, and it's, I don't know, one of the more difficult dance forms on the planet. <laughs> so my legs were burning, and I don't know, I made friends with some of the uh, gypsy girls, which was super fun. I got henna mobbed my first couple days where the gypsies like <laughs> kind of cornered me in a chai stall and forced henna on me, but I was like laughing and enjoying it the whole time. Um, so I loved Pushkar. I fell super in love with Pushkar and it's in and of itself, the lake, the people, the community there, um, the local community, the international dance community, which I just, I think because of where I grew up, I just love culture. And it was so powerful for me to be in a container of women from all over the world, from all different cultures who all were there in India following a similar calling. We all overcame our fears or whatever we had to overcome to get there. Financial barriers, time barriers, um, cultural barriers to partake in something sacred and something beautiful and something, you know, that in our uh, normal everyday culture, we wouldn't think like, why would you give up so much and go so far just for this? But yeah. all of us had done that, you know? <laughs> and yeah, totally. it just, it was like instant community, like deep community to be in that level of intensive practice together um, and to really be held by the local community of Pushkar in that. Like I felt just there was this, uh, it was just really beautiful, you know, because here we are foreigners going into this other culture and country and kind of drinking from it. And I just found the people, like the man I would buy flowers from every day to bring to the altar. Um, there was just the, the, the man I'd get chai from in the morning. It was just like, I felt yeah. so held and so welcomed and so a part of a community instantly. And something that always sticks out to me is years will go by before I go back. And then I go back to Pushkar and everybody remembers me, even though there are so many foreigners that go through there every year. It's like they just remember you they just remember and it's so sweet um, it is that is that one of the community. magical things about india <laughs> yeah <laughs> they yeah. don't forget a face <laughs> no they don't yeah it's so true it's really sweet and to see some of the kids there grow up you know it's like all of a sudden the the little boys now running the shop you know <laughs> and stuff like this so it's just fun to to get to participate and be a part of that and yeah. in some capacity. And it's just such a different, uh, a different culture. And it really, it's something I feel like we're missing in, a, in the West is that really tight knit community. Mm. Um, and it's, it just feels like a privilege to get to experience that. Totally. So, so Tell me, uh, I'd love to now learn about your, because I know you teach Tantra Yoga and I love the way you uh, teach it in, in, you know, in the classical way with so much integrity and knowledge. So I'd love to understand how did Tantra Yoga and the Tantric esoteric practices come into your life yeah. uh, during this journey in India and into the Eastern arts? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I... Uh, also in Pushkar, <laughs> I remember going into, you know, they have these amazing bookstores in India. And at this point, I was just like, in between my classes, I could pretty much not walk or do anything. So I was just burying my nose in books. 
<laughs> about Tantra mostly and other esoteric uh, philosophies. I was reading this really sweet book called, I think, Ka, about all the kind of mythos of India. And I was like falling in love with the, the deities. And I'd already been to a couple temples. I went to a Dorga temple right off the bat in Jaipur, some... Uh, rickshaw driver was just like you want to go to a temple and I was like okay (laughs) so I I kind of had her blessing right out the gate and I wanted to know more about her and I wanted to know more about Shiva and um, it was this indescribable kind of love at first taste you know and like I said they'd been trickling in before India and they were kind of like I feel like tickling at my soul that we were going to be on a much deeper journey. And so that deeper journey started my first trip. And um, I remember one mark, mark, marked thing was finding a David Frawley book in one of the Pushkar bookstores about Tantra Yoga and the wisdom goddesses. The oh, goddesses. I love that book. Yeah, exactly. So I, I found it. that first trip and I was just like zhunk, you know just zeroed in on it and I've literally probably read the book like five times now <laughs> <laughs> because anytime I want to revisit those energies and those teachings I just eat up his books and then I, I read Tantra by George Feuerstein and um, Tantra Quest by Daniel Odier and so I just like started eating these books up and um my 25th birthday was going to be in India. I've had several birthdays in India now, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I really wanted to go to Varanasi. I'd heard, you know, so after Pushkar, I, uh, with one of the women I'd been in dance training with, we decided we were going to go to Varanasi. And it just felt really important to me. And I wanted to go on my 25th birthday and meditate on death essentially you know in the west we hide that aspect of society it's like it almost doesn't even exist unless you have someone close who passes away and um i i wanted to go to the burning ghats and i wanted to go to the abode of lord shiva i was kind of in this like love play with shiva at the time where it was like all about shiva and i was just in this exploration of like form and formless and like okay I I'd had all these challenges and actual relationships with the masculine like and with men and stuff like this and I kind of started instead of hooking that into the horizontal plane I started just having a love affair with the divine with consciousness and it was just this kind of unintentional beginnings of my path of tantra and um So I wanted to go to his holy city. I wanted to feel and understand Lord Shiva. And um, so I took a sleeper class train, uh, which ended up being, I don't even know how many hours late. I think I was on the train for like 30 hours or something just to get from Pushkar to Varanasi. That's a long journey. Oh my God, on sleeper class. Wow, so So brave. Got the foot. Well, I just didn't know, <laughs> but I'm glad I did because it was just like I really got an experience out of the deal and um, finally got in. And we ended up having to because trains were booked, we couldn't go straight to Varanasi, so we went to I think it's called Mogul Sarai or something like that. And mm ended up taking a rickshaw through like a dust bowl full of big trucks. I mean, it was insane. Get into Varanasi immediately. We got sideswiped in the rickshaw, uh, like an ac- a minor accident, luckily. But I was just like, whoa. It was like I was out of my pushcar bubble and... <laughs> into medieval ages. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, but I loved Varanasi yeah. and I remember my first time going to the Burning Ghats and um, where they transition souls from the physical into the ethereal realms and I'd never in my life seen a body yeah. before and I had no idea walking up there, you know, there was so much anticipation, I had no idea how I was going to feel about it, what I was going to think. And when I got there, I just, I was there for hours and I just, what really stood out to me was actually beauty Mm. and the, and that, that, that transition can be beautiful. And I, I really noticed the intention 
that is placed in that whole process. You know, the, the pujaris that are there holding that sacred fire that in Varanasi, I think they said it's that that flame has been tended by the priests for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Yeah. And yeah. they use that same flame that they do all the ceremony to, to light the pyres um, and send the souls mm -hmm. into, you know, hopefully liberation, you know, and there's just a different orientation around death when we see it as a possible liberation rather than the end, you know, and yeah. this loss of everything. It's like, yeah, so I just, that was really moving to me. And also in Varanasi, something really powerful that happened was um, I went to the Dorga temple there. Mm -hmm. And Dorga, again, she's just been with me since the beginning. She's kind of been this guiding light um, of the mother in my life. And uh, so she was already there, but I went to her temple in Varanasi specifically. And it just, I really, I feel like I really got her blessing in that temple. And I remember the temple surrounded by the city and it's super loud and boisterous and there's horns honking outside of the temple. And I walked in those temple doors and it was just this unbelievable silence and this unbelievable feeling of just being so deeply held. Mm. And the devotees, everyone coming in, I just felt the devotion and the love of the mother in all of those that were coming in there. And the way it was like the only sounds were the ringing of the bells by the devotees. And mm -hmm. it just, something in me cracked and had... Uh, I just wanted my, my biggest wish at that point was to learn how to worship the mother and and to have her in my life. <laughs> and that really was, I think, what began my deeper tantric journey was this desire to be close to uh, particularly the mother. The worship of the mother. And so uh, have you, along the journey, you know, they always say that the guru comes to you to teach you because I know that in Tantra yoga, it's very important to be initiated uh, into the esoteric practices of worshiping the divine mother, because these are yeah. practices that have been hidden away. It's, they are hidden. They are not for everyone. So I'm so curious to know, like, how do you have a teacher? How did that teacher come into your life? How was that process? Because I think it's important for people who want to know about Tantra Yoga, understand exactly how the process is, about, uh, the process is on getting into this path. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing I'll say is it's not linear and it's not a quick fix. It's not yeah. part of this Western fast food mentality where I want, I get. It, it's not like that at all. In fact, that part of the ego will get thrashed <laughs> in the process of finding a teacher. So my journey was long. It was long to really finally anchoring in because I had to be ready. And I was really one of those Westerners who was impatient and just wanted it and sought it. And uh, there was a lot of grace along the way, but Ma was also like, okay, you're ready to this point. Okay, now you can go to this point. But there was a seasoning that had to happen. And mm -hmm. um, so for me, how did this all go? It's kind of a long, again, not linear story there were a lot of breadcrumbs along the way and i received more than i uh, understood at the time in hindsight there was a way that ma was guiding my every journey because when we do step into this deeper path we it's a path of surrender it's it's really a path of surrender and um you know uh, we, <laughs> ma's doing it all <laughs> so that i mean or Shiva or, you know, whatever your Ishtadeva or Ishtadevi is, your primary uh, deity of worship, of communion, uh, you're, in your, you're in their hands, you mm -hmm. know? And, and looking back, I can see, my God, I've been so in her hands all along, you know? But the timing has to be right. The ripening, we don't eat the fruit before it's ripe, you know? We wait. 
there's a patience that's needed. And I trying to think. So it, you know, obviously there was the dance that was already happening. So I was, I was deeply immersed in that. And that was kind of my first uh, taste of real sadhana. And at that point, I didn't have the, you know, I had too much fire. I needed to move. I wasn't going to be good at sitting and being in meditation and being in practice in that way. Um, and, you know, this is a tangent, but it's amazing how the universe works because at some point uh, I had a really serious knee injury that took me away from dance for three years. And that was when I learned how to sit. That was when I learned how to go into those deeper sadhanas. And um, as challenging as that time was, I don't know if I would have been ready to go deep into sadhana. And when I say sadhana, I mean very disciplined uh, tantra yoga practice that is not, it's not asanas, it's not all these pretzel shapes, it's not, it's literally, it looks like this. Mm. And there's a lot going on inside, but we have to be able to sit, we have to have that patience. And I don't, I don't know if I would have been ready for that next level of sadhana if I hadn't had the knee injury. So it's just like one of these things where as we go on this path, the distinctions of good and bad, like I could look at that as like this bad thing that happened in my life, but there was so much good that came out of it. There was a ripening that came out of it. So I think we have to start looking at life like that, like even these obstacles that come into our lives are actually a part of the process and they help to purify us and bring us to that next level. So I went on a big search and um, before the knee injury happened, one of my trips to India, I was living in my uh, dance Guruji at the Times uh, house in the village, Katabahal, um, in Orissa. And there was a woman who I knew from the California kind of like West Coast Festival community who was there uh, with her teacher at the time visiting the ashram of this tantric master in Andhra Pradesh. And she then came to the village to study. She knew I was there and she was curious about ODC. So I made that connection happen. She came. She was telling me all about this Guruji and this ashram. Uh, he was a teacher of Sri Vidya. Tantra, which is the Shakta branch of Tantra. And I just lit up and I was like, I have to go. I heard about Kamakya Temple for the first time. This was my second trip to India, by the way. Um, and it was just like, oh my God, I have to go. <laughs> and I had at this point, I was already obsessed with going to uh, Devi temples and Shiva temples <laughs> particularly. And so I was already, I'd started this uh, pilgrimage thing. So my trips to India looked like dance study and pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. <laughs> I'd always do different pilgrimages. And I, I fell in love with the Shakti Peets, uh, the, the places where Shakti's parts of her body fell and temples sprang up and there are different faces of her. So that became kind of a devotional hobby of mine is if I was ever close to a Shakti Peet, I'd, I'd make the pilgrimage to go there and bring offerings. And uh, if I was able, if it was appropriate to do some mm -hmm. practice in the temple. And um, so I heard about this Guruji, I heard about the ashram, and I was just like, oh my God, I have to go. So fast forward, I live in Ashland, Oregon, Southern Oregon, and there was another ODC dancer there um, who was a senior student of Ratna Roy, uh, who's uh, most closely associated with the lineage that came out of the Mahari traditions through um, Pankaj Charan Das. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a little bit of a different flavor of ODC into my body and vocabulary at the time. Um, than the Kelly Charan Mohapatra lineage uh, that I feel like ended up being very um, helpful. Very, they, they really supported the deepening of my dance vocabulary. So while I was there, I was um, kind of co-teaching with this woman. Her name is Ruth Rhiannon at a local dance space. Um, and one day, this woman, uh, who's now a dear friend of mine, Janice Craig, heard about the ODC that was happening there and she was working nearby and she ended up coming to class 
And we hit it off immediately, and she started telling me about how she studies um, Shakti Tantra at this ashram in India. And I immediately knew, I was like, is it this guru? Is it this ashram? And she was like, yeah, you've heard of it. And I was like, yeah, I'm planning to go next year and also to go to Kamakya Temple, which is like one of the main Shakti Peets, one of the main tantric pil pilgrimage sites. And she's like, yeah, and I'm, I'm going next year also. She's like, actually, I'm bringing a group. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, it would be amazing to go with her because, you know, it's not always easy to go into these places alone. <laughs> it's not really recommended to go not alone. Not really recommended. Yeah. Especially Kamakya. But even uh, the ashram, it was like, okay, I now have somebody who knows the territory and I can go there with her. And That's so wonderful. Yeah, and so I ended up doing that and um, received initiation from him and fell in love with him and with the tradition. And I was just like, oh my God, after all this time it happened. And I uh, went to pilgrimage, yeah, which in Kamakya, just coming full circle, there's a temple to each of the, the Dasa Mahavidyas, those tantric wisdom goddesses from the book. And so I got to go and, and make offerings and, and meditate in those temples. And it just was so ecstatic for me. Um, so fast forward, Guruji passes away before he leaves mm. his body, before I was able to go back there. So it was like one of those moments on the path where I was like, I felt like I'd found my teacher. And then I felt abandoned, sort of, you know, not that he mm. left, you know, but it was just like, wait, that's it <laughs> but I just trusted and like once you take initiation there's a whether that teacher is in body or not there's still a communication there's still a connection and so I really prayed and I was just like okay what's next you know guide me to and the next port couple other trips. Yeah, yeah let me keep going like please I want to keep going and uh and so yeah, I mean, there were a lot of ways I dipped in and out, but it was like, I was in like the, I think of it as a swimming pool, and there's like the kid side of the swimming pool, and then there's the deep end, you know, <laughs> and I was like splashing over in the kid side for so long, you know, and I, I went back to India, and I did a tantra yoga training, um, an actual training that was under a lineage of Bhairava Tantra, um, mm -hmm. under Guruji Rajkumar Baswan with um, Ra Lalita Dasi, amazing school. I highly recommend her work. Um, she's a really, it's a really amazing bridge into real traditional Tantra yoga. Um, and, you know, he also works with the Dasa Mahavidya. So I was really excited to meet him and do that process. Um, and it was really, his work is very strong. And I had my first Kundalini fever uh, working with him and it was you know this is where I always say like we, we do need a teacher we do need guidance because we should not play with these practices like toys <laughs> because they're real and if we are not integrated if we're not prepared for what they will start shifting in our consciousness and in our energy um, things can go wrong for reals and uh, so I had my first my first very humbling taste of like what happens if the mind receives too much too soon and I literally I don't even know how to describe it but it felt like my mind was like if you took a, a bowl of marbles and you just like dumped it out all over the floor and they're all flying in different places I felt like my mind was slipping like that and I couldn't grab onto anything it was like all of those normal reference wow. points that we have in our everyday just went like shattered and it was really a wild experience. And I was like burning up. I was literally, I felt like I was sitting in a fire and it was like two in the morning. I was, you know, at the school was on the banks of the Ganges and I almost wanted to just go down and throw myself in the river at like two in the morning. But I was like, I don't know if I should do that. I don't know if I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day I felt fine, no problems whatsoever. But it was that moment I was like, am I cut out for this path or maybe just that approach is not for me mm. so I didn't continue uh with that teacher although I hold him in very high respect and that is a path for some people it's very like vira it's very uh, you know this you have to have some chutzpah to go <laughs> on 
that path, uh, which is fine. It's, it's one way. Um, and my current teacher explains it, that there's kind of two methods for working with Kundalini, which is the energy that leads us to our awakening. There's one, one way, and a lot of traditions use this way, where we kind of go and we like bang on her door to get her to wake up. <laughs> and uh, we better be prepared because, I mean, how does it, you know, how do any of us react if someone wakes us up in that way? Versus, like, let's say someone like brews some nice tea or coffee and the scent starts wafting in the room and maybe there's flowers by the bed and they draw back the curtains and the sunlight starts to come in and we just naturally want to like, huh. Ah. Yeah. So the, the other way we can work with uh, Kundalini is that we just create such a beautiful inner environment that she naturally mm. just kind of starts to stir from blossoming. Yeah. And so this is the way my current teacher explains it. And it's just, I'm like, that's my, <laughs> that's more my vibe right there. Um, so it's a process of inner, inner purification. It doesn't mean we don't go through those challenges, but um, I think the challenges are part of the journey. You they're know? absolutely part of, of the, gr the process of awakening and growth. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, when we go on this path, those challenges are going to amplify because it speeds up our karmas it speeds up the resolution of our karmas so it's not that we get home home okay i do the practice and now i don't have to deal with any of my shit no it's mm. not that it's that you'll deal with your shit faster so you get through it but it'll feel like uh you'll have moments of total chaos and of like, overwhelm <laughs> yeah of overwhelm yeah it's not a path for the faint of heart not at all yeah, yeah i did eventually uh find my teacher and um it's been a huge huge blessing and mm. she is uh, a continuation like i said i prayed to guruji and i was like what next and i wasn't ready i really wasn't and so it took some years later before he sent her to me <laughs> and uh and the continuation of that lineage so i get to see I get to continue and uh, and also other lineages um, from the the Devi, the Yogini from uh, Daniel Odier's book, Tantra Quest, uh, that lineage also streams down into this lineage. So um, yeah, it's been super beautiful and super powerful. But from the point I wanted initiation to the or, or to have that continuation to the point it actually happened, it was a journey. Eight years? <laughs> Eight years? I don't remember. I'd have to look. But yeah, it took, it took time. It took some time. And now today you are running a very successful business online and teaching people all over the world and running courses and have completely embraced uh, this path as your path fully and making a living out of it, which takes, takes so much courage, yet it is your dharma. And you also take people on pilgrimages to India. So that is really so wonderful and inspiring, at least for me when I witness your work and I read the, the reviews of the people who study with you. It's, uh, it's really, you know, it's, it's beautiful to witness someone's journey along the years and then seeing the fruits blossom, you know, through other people's, you know, uh, experiences with you. So how has it been for you teaching? How has it been for you organizing, you know, it's, uh, all of your work, you know, and taking people to India? I mean, it, it takes so much courage to bring a group of foreign women to India on a Shakti pilgrimage. I mean, I'm sure so much comes up for these women when they're visiting these sites, you know? So, you know, how do you hold that container? You know, how can people feel safe with you when you, uh, you know, when you mm -hmm. offer, give these offerings? I think it's important that people can, you know, feel that now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, um, there was a point, so like I was saying, and when I was younger, I was just like, I was so hungry, and I was just eating all this up. 
and there was a I was like consuming <laughs> all of the the wisdom and the practices and all of this and just I couldn't get enough and there was a certain point just along my own ripening where the tide kind of turned and all of a sudden I wanted to give I wanted to share and especially when I you know, if you looked at pictures of me or met me, you know, 10 years ago versus now, it's like these practices have had a profound effect on my life. And so there just came a point where I was like, I want to share what I found, you know, and one of the graces of having a teacher is and a guide on these journeys is like, okay, it took me 10 years. But then if I can share that 10 years, someone else's journey might be a little bit quicker, you know, and, and their, their process of awakening and discovering and all of this. And, and this is really where the respect of our teachers comes in is like, this person has walked this path and they are now turning around and offering the jewels of this path. So um, I'm just going to say right here as I'm saying that I am not a guru, I'm not, you know, but, but I have started guiding and bringing others into um, the places that I can appropriately uh, share with people within these realms. There's a lot that I can't share, you know, that I'm not authorized to share, uh, but there's a lot that can be shared. And particularly, I like to teach um, how we can use the principles of Tantra in our everyday lives to benefit them, to beautify them, to bring more consciousness and embodiment to them. Um, so it's very easy to do that with the principles, uh, with the actual practices. Some are open and some are not. And so it's just depends what can be shared there. Um, but it's been such a joy to get to share these jewels with others. And as far as um, the pilgrimage, you know, like I said, going to India is no small thing, and especially as women. And it is actually literally safer to travel in a group um, in India. It's, uh, and we get that experience of Sangha, which is something that I really loved. Like I was saying when I went to Shakti School of Dance, was just this feeling of all these women coming together for a shared vision and purpose. And it, I feel like, especially as women, it amplifies when we're together in that. So there's something so beautiful that happens when we come together and we're held together. And I mean, it's India. So even if I'm leading a pilgrimage, I can't guarantee that your the room in the hotel is going to be perfect, you know, or yeah. that things are going to happen on time. And I, you know, I actually offer, I have a whole waiver that's just like, you know, Anytime we go to India, whether it's on our own or with a group, there's a level of surrender. Like this is a spiritual journey. We don't get to map out perfectly our spiritual journey. Sure, we have a structure, we have some intentions, but then we have to just show up and see what happens and trust that if obstacles do arise, like I was sharing, they're part of our purification. They're okay. part of our process. And how we navigate those says everything about us. <laughs> you know, it's not when everything's going right that tells the true nature of a human being. It's, it's how they are when everything's going wrong, you know? And uh, so... That in, is some big truth you're saying right there. <laughs> it is. Yeah, so it's like, <laughs> yeah, stuff is going to come up. You can't go to India and not be changed. Or so challenged. I, I, or challenged both mm -hmm. but those challenges mm -hmm. will change you yeah 100 you know, regardless whether you're blissed out the whole time like my first actually my first number of trips i was just blissed out and it wasn't <laughs> until later I, I started being like i can kind of understand how some people don't like this <laughs> but uh you will be challenged going to india and um and that's part of it, you know, it's like we go there to grow and to kind of break out of our own conditioning and to see something different. And, you know, we don't have cultures in the West that are so infused with spirit, that are so infused with a sense of the sacred. And 
uh, it's there's a there's an energetic exchange for us to go and be immersed and experience that and that is that the sacred is not just one thing it's you know sometimes in India we see things that are really hard to see in the human realm you know we see green poverty we see humans that are living off of polluted resources we see an earth that's been sub severely depleted we see animals that are in compromising situations and positions and yeah uh, i mean india has a lot of problems i'm not going to glorify india has you know serious it's serious it's like an in proportionately the light is 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 the dark the dark it to the light is the dark in india and you can't avoid that and going there but we also can avoid that in life and we, as westerners tend to make it our mission to kind of avoid that mm -hmm. part of reality and i think there there our power actually comes when we face it and so there is a stretching of the heart <laughs> that happens when we go to india and i think that for sublime shakti pilgrimage the pilgrimage that i co-lead with uh, my very dear uh sister yogini Trika, um ananda shakti who lives almost full time in india you know she's mm -hmm. she's more you know my senior on this journey and on this path um and honestly i don't know if i do this without her because she has so much experience that it's just like with two of us holding that container uh, it feels solid. And we have a Brahmin priest um, who also is with us on the journey. And he's Indian and he's of that. Of Westerners all of a sudden shows up in a temple. But we have this intermediary who is helping us to go there. And then it's also really important to me in that container, I really let people know how we can respect the culture that we are participating in like mm, you know so important shops. yeah so important how you know like okay don't wear your shoes into people's homes or shops don't you know uh or temples or yeah definitely not the temples and uh we always bring an offering we don't just go and take from the temples we bring something mm -hmm. um and there's just certain etiquette and protocol that if you go to india by yourself like I did the first time, there was like a little bit of a learning curve, you know, where it's yeah. like with, with this group, it's just, we know what we need to do. Ananda Shakti and I have so much experience with India and uh, the traditions and what is respectful. And largely my experience has been with the people, they are so welcoming. And we owe it to them because of how welcoming and inviting they are into the gems of their culture and tradition. Like largely, I've found that they are they're thrilled <laughs> that we're interested, that we want to know more, that we want to experience their culture. It's like they almost they feel honored by that. Um, That's so it's wonderful. Least, yeah, it's the least we can do to then uh, return that. I remember the first pilgrimage. Uh, there was a practice at the 64 Yogini temple in Orissa. And they, you know, we asked permission if we could do a, the yoga and dance practice in the temple. And it happened. And they <laughs> ended up in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were so tickled by it that they took photos and it ended up in the newspaper. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me, how is it uh, been for you sharing all of this, you know, Eastern wisdom in the West? I assume you're still in California. Yeah. How has it been for you sharing these, you know, Eastern practices and philosophies in the West? Yeah, um, you know, it's for me, it's my greatest joy. It's like I could talk all day about all of this and go into the practices and all of that. Um, I feel like... I mean, I love it. It's amazing. Uh, what I share, because it is so rooted in the tradition, it's not, I, I find that not everybody is drawn to me in my work. You know, again, it's like there's the kind of more neo-tantra and then the kind of more conventional yoga, and that's more accessible to a lot of people. And so it takes a certain type of person to be drawn deeper, you know? And, and again, I, th I think that those other the neo-tantra, the conventional yoga, 
are beautiful and I don't personally want to judge them because I think that they end up playing gate, a role as gateway for those that are going to go deeper. Now some people might just hang out there and stay there and the way I refer to that is like it's like you go to this amazing temple, right? And the temple itself is so beautiful that you don't even bother to go inside. You're just standing at the gate and you're like, wow, you know, like I'm here. <laughs> but you don't even go into the inner sanctum and receive the darshan, receive the actual energy, the shakti of that temple. And uh, so for those that really have that heart and that soul and uh, can feel that there's something more, they're going to go into the temple. They're going to go into the inner sanctum and... Um, those are kind of my ideal students uh, and and probably I'm more of an ideal teacher in that realm because I want to honor the traditions. I want to share them, you know, in a way that it does breed, uh, come into the, the Western audience. And I think the way that I choose to do that is to share a lot of the philosophy because I think we need to have context to... Uh, hold a container for our experiences within the practices otherwise yes. you know in India it just it's kind of a given like they have a certain spiritual context and then they don't need a lot of explanation why we do this why we do that but in the west we do kind of need that because it's it's a totally different way of thinking and and viewing so I love sharing in the west and I really I especially love it when I find those students that have that desire to really go in deeper who want to know more um, I was that person and now it's really fun for me to get to turn around and kind of hold the door open for others who have that same feeling so where can uh, people what kind of offerings are you giving right now and uh, where can people find you yeah so my website is shakti temple arts.com and you can also find me on instagram same handle shakti temple arts and I'm on Facebook. So um, I also have a YouTube channel that's under my name, Halo Saranko. You can kind of check out more of my uh, teachings there. Um, and on my website uh, is all of my offerings, my current offerings. So I am gearing up, you know, we're in very interesting times right now. So um, <laughs> we are anticipating that we will be able to go back to India in January of 2022. Uh, with the, the goddess's blessings. Um, so Sublime Shakti Pilgrimage is geared towards 2022 and we are going to um, have a three-week pilgrimage. We are going to start the first week where we're just going to be in one space and so we'll kind of get to go into retreat and recover from our journeys and start establishing our practices within Tantra Yoga and Odissi Dance and uh, a little bit of... of baby uh, sadhana, baby tantric sadhana, yeah. beginner tantric sadhana. And then we get to go to um, Orissa. We'll be in Orissa for the temple dance uh, or sorry, season. Yeshwar, yeah, dance festival for the, the dance season. And we'll get to go to Varanasi because Varanasi, we're going to go there for Shiva and then we go to Kamakya Temple to commune with Shakti. So that's coming up in January 2022. Um, and I also have two online courses that are just, you can sign up for them anytime. You can do them at your own pace. I have one in the Taoist arts for women and then I have one that's more this idea of that love play before between form and formless and the tantric realms. And I have some amazing guest teachers in that course, um, some of whom I've named <laughs> in our time here together. So you can find those on my website under online courses. Um, and I'm currently doing live online classes in Tantra Yoga, in ODC dance, and in uh, what I call Shakti Temple Dance, which is a mindful kind of fusion of uh, different streams of dance for the sacred feminine That's so those are my big things and I do mentorship programs and private work as well and so what message now to wrap up our interview what message do you have for anyone who would love to study these esoteric arts with you or would love to go to India what is your message yeah that's a good question so First of all, uh, I just want to reiterate 
that, you know, to have patience and faith in the process because it's whether you study with me, whether you study with someone else, whether you go to India, um, this, this path is like a flower that we can't force the petals open it just kind of has to bloom in its own time but what we can do for action steps is you know like any gardener we can make sure our soil is is good we can start to tend the the flower you know so create the conditions in your life that are going to allow this to come in and we can do that by um, starting to solidify if we don't already have a personal practice whether that is yoga and it doesn't matter if it's more conventional or if it's tantra yoga but just finding a sort of rhythm that says to the universe that says to the divine i'm willing to put forth my effort in order to receive your grace because it's an equation on this on this path we have to give in order to receive the grace of the divine we have to give our efforts we have to make offerings uh, this is why I would go on so many pilgrimages. It was kind of me, you know, gently coming to Ma's door again and again and saying, hi, I'm still here. <laughs> I brought you something. <laughs> um, and we don't do that transactionally. We're not like, I brought you this, now give me this. But it's just yeah. this, let it be from a place of devotion. And, and mm. devotion doesn't need to get anything. It's just for the sake of that love and when that really truly ripens, I feel like then the grace comes. And so have patience with the process and and trust, you know, if you're here and this is speaking to you and there's something in your soul, that's the beginning of the journey. And and from there, it will just unfold. So pay attention. Don't miss those little signs. Don't miss those opportunities. Uh, but no need to be premature either just let it let yourself ripen like a fruit i think that would be my my invitation and then also i just want to reiterate that you know especially as westerners we are coming into another culture we are drinking from a well that that comes from a, a different tradition and so to do so with the utmost humility and respect and honoring because we have a way that we we take a lot in the west and and so find a way that to have a reciprocal relationship with that to give back um to that culture that is offering so much whether it's this one or another culture and uh make a home in it don't let it be like a a teaching i share a lot is about discerning essence from ego we don't want to come into these practices to build up more of an identity for ourselves. We want to come into them so that we can become more of who we already are. And that's a process of stripping away, not adding to. So watch yourself as you go into this journey. And if you feel that kind of grabbing, just soften around it, surrender, offer yourself, let the journey take you. Mm. <laughs> that is a beautiful way to end this interview what a wonderful thank you so much for sharing your teachings and your experience i'm really uh, blown away it's really inspiring i mean congratulations for having the courage to really follow your heart you know it is really it takes so much courage and so i just want to acknowledge that in you and uh, so inspiring to get to know your story and I really pray that it will be continuously fruitful and fulfilling and uh, that you may continue to benefit so many people in your hometown and around the world with your devotion it shines through you <laughs> you're radiating it so it's a radiance there's like radiance all around you so she's definitely with you blessing you up and with that i want to just thank you so much for sharing your story halo it's been so wonderful to um, learn from you and be inspired by you and may your story inspire anyone who listens to this or watches this video so thank you so much for joining me blessings on your journey may ma always protect you and guide you and 
fuel your path with radiance and love and a lot of rose petals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jay Ma. Yeah, Jay Ma, Jay Ma, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, dear. And thank you to all of you who are listening and tuning in. It's been an honor. <laughs> Thanks.